Do you remember when we talked about the book of Genesis? It's the first book of the Bible, remember? The word Genesis means beginning. And the book of Genesis tells all the beginnings, doesn't it? The beginning of the world, the beginning of the sun and moon and stars, the beginning of plants and animals and people, the beginning of the Jews, God's special people, and the beginning of God's promises of a Savior for us. Do you remember the names of the people in the book of Genesis? How it tells about Adam and Eve and Noah and Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and about Joseph and his brothers? The book of Genesis starts with God creating everything in the world, doesn't it? And ends with the Jews down in Egypt. Do you remember that Joseph had told his brothers that someday God would take them out of Egypt and take them back to the promised land, to Canaan, what we now call Palestine? And then Joseph told them that he was going to die, and that when God took them back to the promised land of Canaan, that Joseph wanted them to carry his body back to the promised land with him. And those true stories are what the first book of the Bible, Genesis, is about, isn't it? Well, the second book of the Bible is called Exodus, and it has some exciting true stories in it. Would you like to hear some of those stories? Exodus means going out. You've seen signs that say exit in buildings, haven't you? Well, an exit is the way you can go out of the building. Exit and exodus are sort of the same word. Well, the book of Exodus is going to tell about when the Jews go out, exit, out of Egypt, when God takes them out. It begins some years after Joseph dies, and it's full of stories. So let's have some of the stories from Exodus. All right? In the beginning of the book of Exodus, the Jews are still in Egypt, and they're having very large families. So there are getting to be more and more Jews. Remember, the Jews are also called Hebrews and children of Israel. Hebrews and Jews and the children of Israel all mean the same thing, don't they? Remember, Israel was the other name of Jacob, and the Jews are all descended from Jacob. They are the great, 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 great grandchildren of Jacob, of Israel. So the Bible often calls them the children of Israel, the children of Jacob. Well, there were getting to be more and more Jews in Egypt. Then there came a king of Egypt, the Pharaoh, who hadn't known Joseph. He became worried about all of the children of Israel, the Jews. There were so many of them, and he was afraid that someday they might help an enemy of Egypt to fight against Egypt. So, first Pharaoh made the children of Israel be slaves and work hard for him. But there got to be still more and more Jews. So, the king of Egypt... Pharaoh told the women who helped the mothers have their babies to kill any boy babies that were born to the Hebrew women, the Jews. Boy babies could grow up to be soldiers, couldn't they? Women who help other women have babies are called midwives. Well, the midwives knew God wouldn't like it if they killed the boy babies, so they wouldn't do it. And God blessed the midwives for that. When that didn't work with the midwives, then the Pharaoh said that any Jewish boy babies were to be thrown into the Nile River. About this time, there was a man named Amram and his wife, Jochebed. Amram and Jochebed were both descended from Levi, one of Joseph's brothers. Amram and Jochebed already had a girl named Miriam and a boy named Aaron. Then they had a beautiful baby boy 
and they knew that the king had said that he would have to be thrown in the river. But the mama, Jochebed, didn't want anything bad to happen to their sweet baby, so she hid him as long as she could. Then, when she couldn't hide him any longer, Jochebed made a box like a little boat and put tar on it so the water couldn't get in it, and she put the little boat in the river near the edge among the bulrushes, plants that grew there. The baby's boy's big sister, Miriam, stood a ways away and watched to see what would happen to her little baby brother. Well, after a while, the king's daughter came down to the river to wash herself in the water. She saw this little boat and sent one of her maids out to get it. When she got the boat, she opened it and saw this pretty little baby, and the baby started to cry. Pharaoh's daughter felt so sorry for the baby, and she liked him, and she knew that he was one of the Jews' babies, a little Hebrew baby boy. Well, Miriam, the baby's sister, had been watching, remember? And she came up to the Pharaoh's daughter, and she said, Do you want me to go get a Hebrew woman to nurse the baby for you? Pharaoh's daughter said, Yes. So Miriam went, and told her mother Jochebed, who came to see Pharaoh's daughter. Pharaoh's daughter said, I'll pay you to take this baby home and nurse him for me. So Jochebed took her own baby back home and nursed him and took care of him, and she was paid for it. God was working everything out, wasn't he? When the baby had grown into a little boy, then Jochebed took him back to Pharaoh's daughter, who adopted him to be her son. Pharaoh's daughter named this little boy Moses. Moses means drawn out or pulled out, because he had been pulled out of the water. So Moses lived there with the king's daughter, and he went to school and learned many things. But Moses knew that he himself was a Jew, a Hebrew, and the time was starting to get near when God was going to take them all out of Egypt just as he had promised. Well, one day when Moses was a big man, 40 years old, he went out to see how the Jews, the children of Israel, were doing. Now, remember that they had been slaves to the Egyptians, Well, they were still slaves to the Egyptians. They had to work very hard and make bricks and build buildings for Pharaoh and do other hard work. And Moses saw an Egyptian beating a Jew. So Moses looked around to make sure that no one was watching. And then Moses went over and killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. Well, Pharaoh found out some way what Moses had done and was going to kill him for it. But Moses ran away and lived in Midian, a land far away from Egypt. Moses settled down there and married a woman from Midian and had two sons. And Moses worked for his father-in-law, taking care of his sheep. A long time, 40 more years went by, and now Moses was 80 years old. And back in Egypt, the pharaoh who had wanted to kill Moses had died, and there was a different pharaoh in Egypt. But the Hebrews, the Jews, were still slaves to the Egyptians, and they cried out to God because they were so unhappy. And now the time had come that God had promised to Abraham back in the book of Genesis when God had told Abraham that God would punish the country that was going to be so mean to Abraham's descendants, the Jews, and that God would take the Jews out of that country. God always keeps his promises, doesn't he? And that time had now come. But they would need a leader, wouldn't they? And who do you think that leader was going to be? Well, let's see, okay? One day, Moses was taking care of his father-in-law's sheep out in the desert near a certain mountain. 
This mountain had two names. One was Horeb, and the other was Mount Sinai. As Moses was taking care of the sheep, suddenly he saw a bush that was on fire. He watched the bush, and he saw that it didn't burn up. That was strange. So he decided to go over and look at it. As he started to go over to the bush, though, suddenly God spoke to Moses from inside of the burning bush and told him not to come near the bush. God told Moses to take his shoes off, that he was standing on holy ground. And then God told Moses who he was. God said, I am the God of your father Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob. Remember, all of the Jews are descended from Abraham, and Abraham's son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob. Well, this scared Moses, and he hid his face. But God told Moses that he, God, knew how badly the children of Israel were being treated by the Egyptians, and that he was going to take them out of Egypt into a very good land of their own, the promised land of Canaan. Then God said, Moses, I'm going to send you to the man who is now Pharaoh, the king there, and you are going to bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Moses didn't know what to think. He didn't know how he could do it. God told Moses that as a sign to Moses, that after Moses had brought the children of Israel out of Egypt, that they would all go back to the mountain where Moses was now, and they would worship God there. Moses was still afraid to try to lead the Jews out of Egypt. He was afraid that the Jews wouldn't believe him either. Moses and God talked back and forth a while. God tried to reassure Moses. God told him that Pharaoh wouldn't let the children of Israel go at first, but then God was going to do some great miracles in Egypt, and finally Pharaoh would let them go. God also let Moses be able to perform some miracles that he could show to the Jews so that they would know that he was sent to them by God. One miracle was that Moses could throw down the rod he held in his hand and it would turn into a snake. Then, when he picked the snake up by the tail, it would turn back into his rod. Now, a rod is a long stick that a man might use in walking. It would be longer than just a cane, like you see now. Moses still didn't want to go to Egypt. He didn't think he could do the job of bringing the children of Israel out of Egypt. Finally, Moses complained that he didn't know how to talk well. God got sort of mad at Moses and told him not to worry about being able to talk. God said that he had already sent Moses' brother Aaron to come meet Moses. God said, I will talk to you, Moses, and you will tell Aaron what to say. Then Aaron will tell the other people. And that's what happened. Aaron met Moses, and together they went clear down into Egypt. Aaron talked to the leaders of the Jews there in Egypt and told them what God had told Moses. And the Jews believed them and worshipped God. Well, then Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and told him, that God, the God of Israel, wanted Pharaoh to let the Jews go and worship God. But Pharaoh wouldn't do it, and Pharaoh began being even more bad to the children of Israel, making them work even harder. And the children of Israel, the Jews, were very unhappy. Now, the Egyptians didn't worship God. They worshipped things like the Nile River and the sun and cows, and frogs? Isn't that silly? How can a river, or a crocodile, or a frog, or the sun be God? Why, God made all those things, didn't he? So now God was ready to show the Egyptians who was really God. When God got through with the Egyptians, they would know that only God is God. God, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, the God that the Bible tells us about, is the only God. So God had ten very bad things happen to Egypt. These things happened one bad thing at a time. 
We call those bad things plagues. But first, before each plague, Moses would go to Pharaoh and tell him, If you don't let God's people go, God is going to do such and such. And Moses would say which plague was going to happen. And, sure enough, it would happen. Of course, everything God says always happens, doesn't it? After each plague happened, Pharaoh would be scared and beg Moses, Please pray to God to take away this awful plague, and I'll let his people go. Then Moses would pray, and God would take away the plague. But, just as God had earlier told Moses, Pharaoh would then change his mind and say they couldn't go. Now, what were these plagues? The first plague was that Moses turned the Nile River into blood. It stayed that way for seven days. The second plague was that lots and lots and lots of frogs came up out of the river and were all over the land and got all in their houses. The third plague was that some sort of biting bug like lice or fleas came all over the people and the animals. Pharaoh's wise men told him that this was caused by the God of the Jews, but Pharaoh didn't pay any attention to these wise men. The fourth plague was that lots and lots and lots of flies came and got into the houses of the Egyptians and all over the land. The fifth plague was that some sort of disease came on all the herds that belonged to the Egyptians, their cows and horses and camels and sheep, and the animals died. But God didn't have any of the animals that belonged to the children of Israel die. They were his people, and he wasn't punishing them, was he? But God was showing the Egyptians that the Hebrews were his special people, and that he was their God. The sixth plague was that the Egyptians got terrible hurting sores on them called boils. Now, remember, after each of these plagues came, Pharaoh would say he had let God's people go. But then when the plague was gone, he wouldn't do it. And that's what he did this time, too. He wouldn't let them go. The seventh plague was that a terrible storm of hail and lightning came. The hailstones were very big. But God had had Moses warn the Egyptians to stay inside and bring their animals in. The ones who believed God did that. They came in and brought their animals in. The hail came and destroyed all the food that was growing, but it didn't hurt the people who believed God or their animals. But any person who hadn't believed God but had stayed outside was killed by the big hailstones. But remember, the Jews lived off by themselves in a certain part of Egypt, didn't they? And God didn't have any of that hail go where they lived, only where the Egyptians were. God was taking care of his people and showing that he was really God, wasn't he? Before the eighth plague, Pharaoh's wise men begged Pharaoh to let the children of Israel go. They told him that God was destroying Egypt. But Pharaoh still wouldn't do it. God still needed to prove to the Egyptians that he was the only God. So the eighth plague came. It was that bunches and bunches of locusts flew in and covered the whole ground. Locusts were like grasshoppers. The locusts ate all of the plants and leaves and grasses and fruit that hadn't already been destroyed by the hail. The ninth plague was a great darkness, so dark that no one could even see his hand in front of his face. It was dark, dark, dark for three whole days. But... Where the children of Israel lived, it wasn't dark. God can do anything, can't he? Well, now God told Moses that after the tenth plague, Pharaoh would be so glad to let God's people go that he would just shove them out of Egypt. This was going to be the worst plague of all. But God told Moses that any people who believed in God wouldn't have this plague happen to them. What God was going to do in this tenth plague was to go through Egypt and kill all of the firstborn people and animals all through Egypt. But anyone who believed God wouldn't have that happen because there was something they could do to stop it. And what do you think that would be? God told them that what they would have to do was to kill a lamb 
and splash its blood around their door and then go inside and stay there. Then when God went through Egypt that night to kill the firstborn, when he saw that blood, he would pass over that house and not kill anyone there. So, all of the Jews and many of the Egyptians, the ones who believed God, did just that. They killed a lamb and splashed his blood around the doorway and went inside and stayed there. And God went through Egypt that night. And when he saw the blood around the door, he passed over that house. But if the people hadn't believed God and hadn't put blood around the doorway and then gone in that house for their night, then he didn't pass over that house. But the firstborn of the people and their animals were killed. And God told Moses to tell the people that they were to remember this time when they had been saved by the blood of a lamb and to make a celebration out of it every year. They were to call this celebration Passover to remember that God had passed over their house that night. We find out later in the Bible that this Passover also was a picture of how we are saved from our sins by the blood of Jesus. Jesus is God's Passover lamb because he died for our sins. And anyone who believes God and trusts in the Lord Jesus to save him from his sins, then God will pass over his sins and let him go to heaven when he dies. The Jews still celebrate Passover even today. It is right near Easter time, the time when we celebrate that Jesus, the Son of God, God's Passover lamb, died for us. His blood was spilled for our sins, but then he became alive again, was resurrected, and is still alive in heaven with God the Father. And if we trust him to save us from our sins, then someday we will be able to be with him forever. Isn't that wonderful? I'm going to be there. Are you? I'm so glad that God passes over my sins. Anyway, back to our story about the Jews going out, exiting from Egypt. Nine plagues had come on the bad Egyptians, and it was now time for the tenth plague. Everyone who believed God, and there were lots and lots of them, killed a lamb, splashed the blood around their doorway, and then went inside, stayed all dressed and were ready to go, and ate a big dinner and waited. And God went through Egypt, and when he saw the blood around the doorways, he would pass over that house. But in all the houses that didn't have blood around the doorway, the firstborn of the people and animals were killed. Then during the night, Pharaoh and all the Egyptians who didn't believe in God got up and found out that in each of their houses the firstborn was dead. They were all crying. They were so unhappy. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and told him, Quick, get up and take everything you have and go worship your God and please pray for me too. And all the unbelieving Egyptians begged them to go quickly. The Egyptians gave them lots and lots of beautiful jewelry and gold and silver and clothes to take with them. Anything to get them to go before the God of the Jews killed them all. They were scared. Well, the children of Israel were already, remember? So they just picked up and left. There were so many of them who left. Remember back in the book of Genesis when Jacob and his sons and grandsons had all gone down into Egypt because of the famine? There had only been 75 of them. But now there were between 2 and 3 million descendants of Jacob who left Egypt that night when the firstborn of the Egyptians were killed. That's lots more people than there are now in your whole city. And do you know something else that they took with them besides all of their cows and sheep and other animals and all of the gold and silver and jewels that the Egyptians have given them? Why, they took Joseph's body with them. Remember, Joseph had told their grandfathers that God would take them out of Egypt and when they went, 
they were to take his body with them. So now they remembered what Joseph had told them, and they took his body with them. And that's the story of the first part of the book of Exodus, the book of the children of Israel when they would exit, leave Egypt. So, let's finish telling the stories in the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, all right? Now, where were we? Let's see. After this first big Passover, when the Lord passed over the houses with the blood around the doors, the children of Israel exited, left Egypt, didn't they? They went out with great riches and carried Joseph's body with them. Well, the rest of the book of Exodus tells how the Jews traveled and finally got back to the mountain where God had first spoken to Moses from the burning bush to Mount Sinai. And there they worshipped God, just as God had said they would do. Anything God says will happen always happens, doesn't it? God knows everything, and God has a plan for everything. And there they built something, too, something we're going to talk about after a while. But how do you think the children of Israel could know where to go as they were traveling? Why, God led them. God told Moses that he would lead them by a big pillar of cloud during the daytime, and at night God would be there in a big pillar of fire. So God would always be with them and guide them where they were to go. But before they got to Mount Sinai, something very exciting happened. Remember, the Jews were hurrying out of Egypt. The Egyptians were very scared and wanted them to leave very quickly. But God told Moses, who was leading the Jews, that after a little while, Pharaoh would change his mind again and want the Jews back to be his slaves again. So, of course, that is what happened. Pharaoh decided that he wanted all those slaves back again. So he took his whole big army, lots of chariots and lots and lots of soldiers, and began chasing after the Jews, the children of Israel. Of course, Pharaoh could catch up with them. The Jews were traveling as fast as they could, but they had lots of cows and sheep and camel with them, and they had their wives and children with them. So they couldn't go as fast as an army, could they? Well, soon Pharaoh and his army had almost caught up with the Jews. The Jews were there by a big piece of water called the Red Sea. And the Jews got all scared and felt trapped and began crying to Moses that they should have stayed as slaves in Egypt rather than just die there in the desert. But Moses told them, Don't worry. Just watch and see what God is going to do for you. You will never see those Egyptians again, because God is going to do the fighting for us against this big army. Well, as Pharaoh and his big army came near, what do you think God did? First, God had the big pillar of fire that he was in stop leading the Jews forward. God had the pillar of fire move from in front of the children of Israel, and it went back behind them and came down in between the Egyptians and the Jews. So it was all dark for the Egyptians, and they couldn't see the Jews anymore. But it was all light for the Jews, the Hebrews. Then God told Moses, to lift up his rod out over the Red Sea. And then God had a strong wind come and blow and blow. And what do you think happened? Why, the water of the Red Sea went apart and made a wide, dry pathway for the children of Israel. And the children of Israel just walked on this dry path all the way across the Red Sea and up onto the other shore with the water all piled up on each side of them like a big wall. What do you think of that? But 
when the children of Israel were all across the Red Sea and safe on the other side, then God lifted the pillar of fire and let the Egyptians see what was going on. The Egyptian king and his army saw the children of Israel across on the other side of the Red Sea, and they saw the dry pathway that God had made through the water. So Pharaoh led his chariots and big army down onto this pathway with the walls of water on each side. God watched until the Egyptians were all down on the long pathway. Then God made it so that their chariot wheels began coming off, and the Egyptians got scared. They realized that God was fighting for the Jews, and the Egyptians decided to turn back and get away. But God told Moses to hold his rod out over the Red Sea again. Moses held out his rod, his stick, and God had the walls of water come pouring down on the Egyptian army. The water covered the whole army, and they all drowned. The children of Israel were all watching this from the other side of the Red Sea. When they saw that the whole army of Egypt and the king were all dead, the children of Israel began singing praises to God. They knew that it was God who had rescued them. Moses led the men in singing praises to God. And Miriam, Moses' sister, led the women in singing praises to God. Well, after that, the children of Israel started walking toward where God was taking them. They still didn't completely trust God to take care of them, though, and they would complain to Moses. At one place, the water was bitter, so they couldn't drink it. When they complained to Moses, God told Moses to throw a certain tree into the water, Then God made the water not be bitter, and they could drink it. At another place, they complained that they weren't going to have enough food to eat. So God told Moses to tell them that God would give them food. That night, God had lots and lots and lots of quails, a certain kind of bird, come around. There were so many quails that they covered the ground. That was a lot of quails, wasn't it? But you'd need a lot of quails to give dinner to two to three million people, wouldn't you? And the people killed the quails and ate them. But a more amazing thing was going to happen the next morning. God told Moses to tell the people how God was going to feed them now. There was a special way that he was going to do it. A way that had never been seen before and would never be seen again after they reached the promised land of Canaan. What do you think God was going to do to feed all of those many people? Well, every morning when they got up in the morning, there would be some strange stuff on the ground, sort of like seeds. They were to gather enough for their families for that day. They could fix this stuff different ways to eat. When the sun came up, the rest of the stuff on the ground would melt, and there wouldn't be any more until the next day. If they didn't gather enough, they wouldn't have enough to eat that day. But if they gathered too much, it would get worms in it the next day and stink. God gave them other special rules about this special food, too, but we aren't going to go into those. Well, sure enough, The next morning, the ground was all covered with this strange seed-like stuff. They had never seen it before. They kept asking each other, What is it? What is it? They didn't speak English, though. And in their language, they said, Manna! Manna! This meant, What is it? And so they called this new food from heaven, Manna, or What is it? And God told Aaron, to take a pot of this, what is it, this manna, and put it away to keep, to show years later to the children of Israel, so they could see how God had taken care of them in the wilderness. And that pot of manna that God told them to keep didn't get stinky or full of worms. 
Well, the children of Israel kept traveling. They got near Mount Sinai, but there was no water for them to drink. Instead of asking Moses to pray to God to give them water, they began complaining and griping at Moses again. They said that Moses had brought them there so that they and their children and herds could all die of thirst. They were so mad at Moses that they were ready to throw stones at him and kill him. Moses cried to God and asked him what he should do, and God told him. And Moses did what God said to do. Moses took his rod, his stick, and hit a certain rock that God showed him. And God made water just gush out of that rock like a river. And all the leaders of the Jews were watching and saw this. And there was enough water for all those many, many people and their animals. Now, some bad people called the Amalekites began fighting against the Jews. The Amalekites would wait and try to catch and kill the people toward the end of the line when they got tired. So Moses called a very godly young man named Joshua and sort of made him a general. He told Joshua to choose some Jews to be soldiers and to go out the next day to fight against the Amalekites. And Moses said that he, Moses, would stand on top of the hill with his rod in his hand. This was the same rod that God had told him to throw down and it turned into a snake. And the same rod that Moses had held out over the Red Sea and it parted. And the same rod he had hit the rock with and God had made water come out of it. In fact, Moses called it the rod of God. So that's what they did. Joshua went out and fought with the Amalekites while Moses and his brother Aaron and his brother-in-law Hur all went up on top of the hill. When Moses held the rod of God up, the Jews would win. But if Moses' arm got tired and he put it down, then the Amalekites would begin to win. So, when Moses got tired, they put a rock under Moses for him to sit on. And then Aaron got on one side of Moses, and Hur got on the other side of Moses, and they held his arms up all day long. And the children of Israel, led by Joshua, beat the Amalekites and killed lots of them. Now, God doesn't like it when people do bad things to his people. So God told Moses to write it down that someday God was going to destroy all of the Amalekites. Well, finally, the Jews all got to the foot of Mount Sinai, the mountain where Moses had seen the burning bush and talked to God. God came down on top of Mount Sinai in lots of smoke and lightning and thunder and a thick cloud and a loud trumpet blew. The people were all very scared. And God told them what we call the Ten Commandments. These are ten big laws that they were to obey. These big laws had to do with worshipping only God and with being good to each other. Later, God would give Moses lots of little laws that would tell just how they were to act and how they were to worship God and how they were to treat each other and even what they could eat. But right now, God just gave these ten big laws, the Ten Commandments. The people were so scared that they were even afraid of hearing God's voice anymore. So they asked Moses to let God just talk to him, to Moses, and that then Moses should tell them what God said. And God told Moses to go up on top of Mount Sinai, and there God would give lots of little laws to him. So Moses went up Mount Sinai. Joshua went part way up the mountain with him and waited there for him. Moses went clear up the mountain, up into the cloud where God was. God told Moses many things. And remember that I said that they built something? Well, one of the things God told Moses was how to build a sort of tent church, a place to be the center of worship for the worship of God. This tent church is called the tabernacle. Tabernacle means a tent or some place to live. It was also called the house of God. 
Now, the people wouldn't be going inside of the tabernacle. Only the priests could do that. But the people would be able to bring their sacrifices to the tabernacle courtyard, and the priests would burn their sacrifices for them. The tabernacle itself was the tent part. Inside, it was to be divided into two rooms by a beautiful curtain. The first room was bigger and was called the Holy Place. Now, holy means something that is separated to God or special to God. So this room was a special, separated room that was to be used in the worship of God. Everything in this holy place was made of gold. Imagine that. There was a big golden lampstand and a sort of small golden altar for burning incense and a golden table for special bread. The priests would be able to go into the holy place to do their work, like taking care of the lamps there and burning incense to God. On the other side of the beautiful curtain was to be the smaller room. It was called the Holy of Holies, the most separate part of the whole separate tabernacle. The Holy of Holies was sort of like a picture of God's throne room in heaven. Inside of the Holy of Holies was going to be only one thing, the Ark of the Covenant. Now, Ark actually means a box, and Covenant means an agreement. The Ark of the Covenant was about the size of a cedar chest and was all covered with gold. The lid was solid gold and had two solid gold cherubim on it. A cherubim is sort of an angel. The regular priests couldn't go into the Holy of Holies where the beautiful Ark of the Covenant was. Only the high priest would go in there once a year. But Moses could go in there, and God would talk with him. Outside of the tabernacle was to be the tabernacle courtyard. There would be a big fence around the courtyard so that the people wouldn't accidentally go into the courtyard. This fence was made out of big white curtains that hung from silver posts. Inside of the courtyard was a big altar made out of brass for burning sacrifices to God and a big brass basin for washing things in. Think how wonderful it all looked. God told Moses exactly how the tabernacle was to be made. It would be majestic and beautiful and it could be taken down and carried when they traveled. God also told Moses just how the priests' clothes were to be made, and just how they were to do things at the tabernacle. God told Moses that his brother Aaron was to be the high priest, and that only Aaron's descendants could be priests. No one else could ever be a priest, just Aaron's sons and grandsons and other descendants. Well, Moses was up on the mountain with God for 40 days. That's a long time. The children of Israel watched the mountain where Moses and God were. They saw the smoke all of the time, and they decided that Moses wasn't going to come down again. So they did something very, very bad. They went to Aaron and asked Aaron to make an idol for them. And Aaron did what they asked. He had them bring their golden earrings, and he melted them down and made a statue of a calf and worked on it with special tools. And people said, Oh, this calf is the God that brought us out of Egypt. Now, that was not only a very silly thing for them to do, but it was also a very, very wicked thing for them to do, wasn't it? Only God is God, isn't he? And then the next day, the people had a big worship time for this golden statue of a calf. But we should only worship God, shouldn't we? Well, God knows everything, so he knew what the people were doing, of course. And God was angry. He told Moses what the people were doing and told Moses to go down the mountain to them. Moses asked God to forgive them, and God said he would. 
God gave Moses two flat stones on which God had written down his Ten Commandments. Moses hurried down the mountain. He met Joshua, who was waiting for him. Joshua heard the noise the people were making, and he thought there must be a war. But Moses told him that it was singing. The children of Israel were having a big party for the golden calf. When Moses and Joshua got near where the people's tents were, Moses saw the idol of the calf and the people dancing around, and Moses was so mad that he threw down the two flat stones that God had given him with the Ten Commandments on, and the stones broke. Then Moses took the statue of the golden calf, and he ground it all up, and he sprinkled the gold in the water, and the people had to drink the water with the gold powder in it. They were drinking the idol they had been worshipping. Then Moses really scolded Aaron, asking him why he had done this great sin. Aaron sort of lied and said that the people had wanted him to make gods for them, and he had just sort of thrown the gold into the fire, and it had come out as a calf. Moses saw that some of the people were being even more wicked in their worship of the golden calf. So he stood there at the edge of the camp, and he called out, Who is on the Lord's side? And the descendants of Levi came to him. Moses told them to start going through the camp with their swords and to kill the people who were being so wicked. And the descendants of Levi did. They killed a lot of the people that day who were being so wicked. The next day, Moses scolded the people and told them how very wicked they had been to make an idol and to worship it. And then Moses went and talked to God and asked him again to forgive them and to be with them and to lead them into the promised land of Canaan. And finally, God said he would. Then God told Moses to cut out two more flat stones like the ones that he'd thrown down and broken and to go back up on the mountain again. So Moses did, and God again wrote the Ten Commandments down on these stones. And God told Moses more things about how the people were to worship God. The stones and the laws were to be kept inside of the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies. Moses stayed on Mount Sinai forty more days and nights with God, and then he went back down to the people. And the Jews had been good this time while he was gone. Moses told the people the things that God had told him. And then Moses told them about the beautiful tabernacle that God had told them to make. The people were so happy to be able to help make the tabernacle. Many of them brought lots of gold and jewels and cloth to use. There were special men who knew how to make the things. They made the things for the tabernacle exactly as God had told Moses to make them. The tabernacle was all finished just a year after they left Egypt, and then Moses made Aaron and his sons to be priests, just as God had told him to do. Then they set up the tabernacle. Everything was done just like God had said it was to be done. And then they offered sacrifices to God. And the cloud of God covered the tabernacle, and the bright glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle showing that God liked the way they had done things. Even Moses couldn't go inside the tabernacle for a while then because of the cloud and the brightness. And now the pillar of cloud would be on the tabernacle during the day, and the pillar of fire would be on the tabernacle at night. And that is the end of the book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible, the book that tells about how the children of Israel, the Jews, exited went out of Egypt. In fact, people call the time when the children of Israel left Egypt the Exodus. And that's where the book of Exodus gets its name. So, let's see now. What was the book of Exodus about? Well, remember, the book of Exodus starts by telling that the children of Israel had been slaves in Egypt. During this time, baby Moses was born and had been saved from the river by Pharaoh's daughter and raised as her son. Then Moses killed an Egyptian and had to run away. He became a shepherd for his father-in-law. After a while, God spoke to Moses out of the burning bush, 
and then sent Moses back to Egypt to bring the children of Israel out of Egypt to the promised land of Canaan. God sent the ten terrible plagues to show the Egyptians who was really God. And finally, with the last plague, when the firstborn were killed, the Egyptians made the Jews leave. God took care of the children of Israel and led them with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He made a dry path through the Red Sea for them, but drowned the whole Egyptian army. God gave them water out of a rock to drink and gave them manna to eat. Then God told Moses the laws they were to have and how to build the tabernacle. So the book of Exodus pretty much starts with the birth of Moses and ends with the tabernacle all finished and set up at the foot of Mount Sinai. And what are the names we need to remember from the book of Exodus? I think Moses and Aaron are the two most important names to remember, don't you? Moses was the leader of the Jews, remember? And who was Aaron? Aaron was Moses' big brother, and Aaron became the first high priest, remember? So, especially Moses the leader, and then Aaron the high priest are the two names to remember from the book of Exodus. You might want to remember the name of Joshua, too. Remember, Joshua was the godly young man who was a general, and the one who went partway up Mount Sinai with Moses. Joshua became important later in the Bible. So Moses and Aaron and Joshua. Of course, mainly, the book of Exodus is about God, though, isn't it? And how God took care of his people, the Jews. And the book of Exodus tells us about the first Passover, when God passed over the houses that had the blood of the lamb splashed around the door. It makes us think of our Passover lamb, Jesus, who died for our sins. And if we trust the Lord Jesus to forgive our sins, then God will pass over our sins, and someday we can go to heaven and be with him forever and ever. Aren't there some exciting stories in the book of Exodus? The book of the exit of the children of Israel from Egypt, of their going out? Remember now, they are true stories, and that God gave them to us. God had Moses write all of those stories down, so we could read them. All of the stories in Genesis and in Exodus that I've told you. I hope you enjoyed hearing them, because I enjoyed telling them to you.